Coming up, consumer food trends for the new year, fighting food waste, and a first-hand perspective from the recent White House conference on hunger, nutrition, and health. All that and more, it's episode three of Omnivore from the editors of Food Technology Magazine and the Institute of Food Technologists. This episode of Omnivore is brought to you by IFT's 2022 Compensation and Career Path Report. Get the latest information on the science of food salaries, benefits, career paths, and more. Download a copy at ift.org slash salary survey. Welcome to Omnivore, the new podcast from IFT and Food Technology Magazine, where we explore the intersection of business, science, and technology in the global food system. I'm Bill McDowell. If you want insight into the latest consumer mindset, look no further than that time-worn cliche from 1992, it's the economy, stupid. A recent poll from Ipsos Global Advisor found that two-thirds of global consumers feel uneasy about their own national economy, and inflation is a top worry. That's prompting a lot of consumers to reconsider the value they're getting from their food and beverage dollars in a variety of ways. Food Technologies Science and Technology Editor Julie Larson Brisher recently caught up with Innova Market Insights co-founder Luann Williams to get her thoughts on how these shifting consumer values will impact food and beverage purchases in the year ahead. Well, hi, Luann. I'm really looking forward to talking with you today to find out a little bit more about your thoughts on where consumer trends are headed in 2023. In our cover story, we heard from experts such as yourself that inflation and uncertainty about the economy are major drivers of current purchasing behavior. How do you think these economic factors are playing out as consumers make food purchasing decisions, but at the same time, they really want to get value for money? Well, that that is the question, isn't it, right? So... This is our our trends season. And if we look at our top 10 trends, our first trend is redefining value. So understanding what that is. And of course, when we do trends, we have to get very top line. But when you look into that and you ask consumers, what do you value and what are you willing to give up? We did a big survey across 11 countries. And what you see, there's a couple of things that kind of stick. Local absolutely sticks with people. If you ask in Brazil and Argentina and Mexico, it's amazing. It's really the thing people don't want to give up. They don't want to give up fresh and natural. They don't want to give up um, benefits that are ingredients that boost um, physical health. And what that tells me is that this is also a little bit about control. So we just came off two years of COVID where we didn't have a lot of control over where we ate, what we did, what we shopped. Now we're at the end of this. Well, part of it was caused by COVID, but we're at this, we seem to have a 10 year business cycle, right? Where things kind of go downhill. We have very messy politics in some countries in the world. So just a few things that we see happening that are, that are tied to this. So we do a a big survey every year and we ask about what's your, your biggest global concern. So that's not what affects your day to day, but what do you worry about? Right. And every year that we've done it, we see health of the population, number one. Last year was the first year we saw health of the planet be number one. And if you think about it, it makes sense. At the beginning of COVID, we saw, if you watch the news, Australia burned, then it flooded, then the U.S. flooded and burned in snow, and then we have this pandemic. So it makes sense. And, and I tell people sometimes market research should never shock you. And, and there will be some surprises, but in general, there's not big surprises, but you're looking for those shifts, right? Well, this year we got a surprise. In Germany, Spain, UK, USA, number one global concern is political instability. And yeah, it's a, and so this also to me also points to control. I, it's, I cannot control that, right? And I remember I flew to New York and I landed in, it was August 22nd. I remember that for some reason. And NBC had just come out with their poll of U.S. voters. And the big concern was threat to democracy. So it really does. It's exactly what we see in our survey. It is the thing people were worried about. So now what you see in other consumer data that comes back, I am taking more actions to minimize food waste, recycle, upcycle, choose products with more environmental friendly packages. Those are things I can control, right? So when you look at what people value, it kind of makes sense. I want things I can see, I can trust, things that bring me health because I, I have to be healthy because I just came to this two-year masterclass and the importance of being healthy. 
And I'm going to do all those small things for the planet that I can do that I can control. So for me, that's what we're seeing happening now. And then just one more point on inflation maybe is I've traveled a lot this year and there are some countries where you feel it worse than others. So China and India are two outliers in terms of they say basically inflation not impacting them, don't seem to have any kind of economic worries from that point of view. But, and I live in Europe, but I'm American. So I've spent, I think I was there four or five times this year. The U.S. is so out of whack with the rest in terms of, I don't know what it is, but the prices are bonkers. So I'm not surprised that you hear Americans. Okay, Americans, we all complain about gas prices first. It's just what we do, right? Because it's on signs everywhere you drive around and we're always in our car. But people that I know also traveling there, some Americans, some not not Americans are just absolutely shocked by food prices in the U.S. So I'm not surprised that the U.S. is slightly different than some other countries when it comes to that as well. Yeah, and not not only the prices, I, I, I was just at the grocery store on Friday, and this has been the case for months and months and months, um, where there's no uh, poultry products in the deli because of avian flu. And they save it for the whole birds and stuff like that, and they're not making sort of deli loaves. And I when I look at that empty case... And when you do get something, they want $15 a pound, where it used to be $6 a pound. And it's, it is a little, it is shocking a little bit right now. <laughs> yeah. In an annual meeting last year, you know, when those in the summer, it was last year, I was giving a presentation. And one of the questions that I got was, it was around higher prices, right? And so this was still kind of really kind of peak COVID almost. And I remember I said to them, I think food is way too cheap in the U.S., And it needs to be more expensive. So for me, this is a time that people are just going to have to accept that I might not be able to buy the $50,000 car or the $30,000 car because groceries cost more and they should cost more. I think farmers are screwed if I can just, maybe that's not nice to say, but they are. And it's time for there to be kind of a readjustment and, and expectations around food prices, but this has gone too far, right? It was too much of a shock, too much, too fast. And so it's very difficult to accept that way because nobody had any chance to um, to adjust for that. Now, coming along to back to the article, and also I think you first mentioned that sustainability and sort of ethical considerations for the planet um, are factors that are really important for shoppers, especially among younger consumers. Um, What's your take on the millennials and the Zoomers? Are they now a market force to be reckoned with, or are they still sort of emerging in these sorts of demand? Oh, I I think Gen Z is going to change the world. And I was at a conference in Canada a month or so ago. And, and I guess it's also, I'm a, I'm an old Gen X. So there were a lot of people my age presenting on the stage and every single one had a story about their Gen Z kids. Right. And, and that we all see that they care. They are, they don't believe anybody. They really do research. They ask their friends. They, they have very different ways to validate what they're seeing, hearing or whatever than we do. Right. They'll go into Instagram and look for experts on things when we would go to the yellow pages or maybe we Google now, they don't even Google, you know, they go ask people, right. So one of our trends is generational push, and it's all about the differences in the generation. So if you think about, we go from redefining value, consumers don't want to give anything up. Um, They're also not, you know, they're not willing to compromise on sustainability, all these things they have to, right? So there's a difference between aspirations and behavior. So I'm just to be realistic about that. But then we also asked, what are your, what are the key purchase drivers? So health benefits and affordability were the key drivers. And again, this is across those 11 countries. So we'd have to dive into the US to be so specific, but in general, it gives you an idea. So health and affordability. And then if you ask Gen Z, flavor is number two over affordability, which makes sense because they're alone, right? Then millennials, affordability was as important as flavor, which makes sense because they have kids that they're having to feed now. And this was the generation that told us, you know, kids were not going to eat at McDonald's. They didn't eat at chain restaurants. Yes, they do. They do now. We knew they would. And then if you get to Gen X and boomers, naturalness is number three over flavor, which is number four, which also makes sense to me because natural is very associated with health. And, you know, you get to our age and you got your first bad cholesterol reading or your first blood pressure reading, and now you're like, holy crap. And then if you're a boomer, you're trying to deal with that, right? So 
so yeah, it you do start to see this generational change, but I think Gen Z, um, they're going to think they have the they have access to information that that Gen Xers did not have. So right or wrong, they're definitely going to make big changes because they're going to also all get together. They're going to find their peers. They're going to create movements. They're going to decide. They're going to validate what they think in different ways than we did. So, you know, if you looked at what they actually have to spend right now, I would say who cares because in 10 years, they're absolutely going to change the world and they're going to make massive, then we're going to get some surprises in our market research. So how important are health-based concerns as a factor that is driving consumer demand in 2023. You mentioned that a little bit earlier. Are are consumers signaling a greater interest in more sophisticated plant-based food and beverages or like functional products to support mental health, for example? All of the above. So I know we're almost out of time. So I'm just going to say all of the above. And again, we would have to dive into all the layers of this. But our second trend is affordable nutrition. So I mentioned consumers don't want to compromise. They want all of the above, all the things you just mentioned, plant-based, sustainability, local, mental health, physical health, and so on. But affordable nutrition, and I worked on this as part of a project team for five years, and maybe the sad reality now is that we were really focused on low and middle income countries when we were in that project team. And now this is, I don't know if you want to call it opportunity, challenge, situation, but that's affecting American consumers, Canadian consumers, European consumers as well. So for me, the biggest untapped market in the world is around affordable nutrition. Well, I know it's weird because I'm walking away from this conversation with you, Luann, feeling like I am Jane consumer, (laughs) except for the Zoomer part. (laughs) Thanks so much for talking with us today. My pleasure. Luann Williams is co-founder and Global Insights Director with Innova Market Insights, a global market research firm headquartered in the Netherlands. You can read her and other experts' predictions for 2023 in the December-January issue of Food Technology. The U.S. Department of Agriculture recently announced increased funding for WIC, its special supplemental nutrition program for women, infants, and children. The WIC program provides federal support for supplemental foods, health care referrals, and nutritional education for low-income women and children at nutritional risk. Food Technologies Associate Editor Emily Little explains where the new funding for the program will go and how this might affect its participants. I'm Emily Little, Associate Editor with Food Technology Magazine, and here's a news story I want to talk to you about. The USDA recently increased their funding and modernization efforts for the Special Supplemental Nutrition Program for Women, Infants, and Children, which is commonly known as WIC. This program was first introduced in 1972 and then became permanent in 1974 and is administered federally by the Food and Nutrition Service within the USDA. This program is targeted at pregnant women, breastfeeding women, postpartum women, infants, and children to make sure that their nutritional needs are met. Now, with these new funding and modernization efforts, a lot of it was funded by the American Rescue Plan Act of 2021, commonly known as ARPA. That included $53 million to this program. With this new funding, the USDA's Food and Nutrition Service awarded grants in three major areas to address the overall needs of the program. And these include community innovation and outreach, technology for a better WIC experience, and the WIC shopping experience. Basically, the USDA is concerned that not enough women and children have access to this program because it's either too difficult to use or they simply don't know that they're eligible. So these efforts are really trying to make sure that everyone knows about WIC and everyone who is eligible is able to have access, whether that's through county health departments, hospitals, mobile clinics, community centers, schools, public housing, increasing that visibility for the USDA so that people know where they can get assistance. A study done in 1990 showed that women who participated in the WIC program during their pregnancy had lower Medicaid costs. It's also linked with longer gestation, higher birth weights, and lower infant mortality. So it just goes to show how important nutrition is, not only for the child themselves, but also for pregnant women. 
According to the USDA, fewer than three out of five of those eligible for the program are currently enrolled. And participation rates are high among families with infants, but tend to drop as the child gets older. So with these new modernization efforts, the USDA is hoping to increase their visibility, strengthen their program, and make sure that these nutritious options are getting to those who really need it. That's all I have for you today. I'll talk to you next time. We'll be back with more Omnivore in a moment. But first, this word from our sponsor. Over 3,000 respondents in two recent IFT surveys offered a ton of insights into salary and career satisfaction. When you download and read IFT's 2022 Compensation and Career Path Report, you'll learn about which regions of the U.S. pay the most, the top five most common job pain points, if the food profession is becoming more diverse, and what jobs make the most money. Get your copy and use it to negotiate your next raise. Go to ift.org slash salary survey. Welcome back to Omnivore. I'm Bill McDowell. Roughly 40% of all food production is lost or wasted. Closing that gap is critical to addressing food insecurity. Over the past year, food technology has spoken with scores of scientists, entrepreneurs, NGOs, and supply chain experts to break down the root causes of food waste, as well as potential solutions throughout the supply chain, from agriculture to manufacturing to retail. Food Technologies Executive Editor Mary Ellen Kuhn recently spoke with Deputy Managing Editor Kelly Hensel and Contributing Editor Dale Buss to recap key learnings from their just-finished four-part series. So this is a question for both Kelly and Dale. In your reporting, what were some of the biggest learnings and were there any surprises? One of the things that I was really surprised by when I started digging into research that very first article was just the sheer magnitude of the problem uh, in that it exists in all countries around the world. It's not a developed country problem or a developing country problem. It's everybody's problem. The fact that 40% of food that is produced isn't making it into the mouths of people that need it, while at the same time, there are so many people that are going hungry, that are food insecure, or that don't have access to nutritional food that they need. It's, it, that's just really shocking. Also, you mentioned the scope of the problem. One, one thing I found very interesting was that, you know, this is preventable in, in so many ways and probably to a great degree of magnitude. You know, so you look at some of the other problems facing agriculture now and in, in the food system now and in the future, you've got, you know, climate change that may be altering things in, in, in significant ways, especially for agriculture, if not further down the supply chain. And then right now you've got war, the Russia-Ukraine war, which is really disrupting supplies of grain and sunflower oil and all this stuff. But waste, you know, it's out there. It's huge, as you said, Kelly, but it is preventable and it can be mitigated in lots of really significant ways. I mean, it costs money like everything does, but it is something that we, meaning everybody, in many different ways, can really do something about, which is exciting in some ways. And I think the other, one of the other big takeaways was that, you know, in so much, as in so much of the rest of the food industry these days, it's consumers are driving the activity. So as consumers are concerned about sustainability, climate change, the supply chain, you know, they're taking a look at this problem of food waste as they learn more about it. And questioning companies, CPG companies, retailers, commodity suppliers, the transportation system, restaurants, you know, what are you doing about it and, and how can we help you? So that's probably the biggest hope for some significant change here. Well, that's a good point, Dale, about it being consumer driven. So Kelly, how can food manufacturers and product developers build on that and work to reduce loss and waste? They're definitely finding ways to create new value streams through upcycling of byproducts that used to just be, um, you know, considered waste and thrown out. But they're also finding ways to cor correct inefficiencies in their current manufacturing processes. I think in that in the third article in the series, there was an example of Bimbo Canada, who was achieving significant food re food waste reduction by even something as simple as 
uh, realizing that when a loaf of bread was entering the slicer, it was somehow turning 30 degrees and uh, (laughs) the slices were uneven and they had to throw the whole loaf out. So by altering just tiny little inefficiencies and during the production process, they're able to really cut down on the waste and, and save money. Well, thanks, Kelly. Well, let's switch over to Dale. As Kelly mentioned, you wrote two of the articles in the series, one focusing on reducing loss on the farm and the most recent one on cutting waste in the last mile. In both cases, it seems like new technologies are helping to make headway toward reducing food loss and waste. What were one or two examples that you found inspiring? One that I found really interesting are, well, actually a class of technologies are, are apps that consumers can use to, uh, you know, sort of actively day by day, store visit by store visit, cut their waste. One is called Flash Food, and there are a number of apps like this, but uh, essentially you go to a website or, or the app and you find out what your local retailer is offering on Flash Food that day, and it's going to be food that might be nearing its sell-by date or its best-by date or for whatever reason, it's perfectly good food, but the retailer is saying, you know, maybe it's time to move this into the bargain bin. And, you know, grocery stores don't have bargain bins, right? But now they do. And so consumers can go online through this app, say, I want to buy, you know, half a dozen uh, quarts of milk that may be nearing their sell-by date. And then the retailer will put those items in, in a cooler or freezer or whatever behind their customer service desk. The consumer pays online, comes in, picks it up. And for the retailer, that provides a way to, I mean, obviously there's some revenue in an area where they would have just maybe passed this on to a food bank or whatever, or wasted it. And for the consumer, they get perfectly good food. They understand it's near its sell by date or best by date, and they get it at a really reasonable price. And there are a whole bunch of retailers working with this um, app. One is Meyer, it's the big uh, superstore retailer in the Midwest. So I found that, you know, really interesting and not not surprising, right, that apps and digital technology are helping to make a lot of progress on this problem. The other major area that I thought was really interesting is how um, startups, again, are coming up with ways to uh, detect deterioration in produce. So it used to be kind of the produce manager at the store would be the last line of defense, you know, pick up the avocado or the orange or apple or whatever, head of broccoli and, and say, eh, maybe this isn't quite going to pass muster here. But now there are new technologies using either optics uh, or gas detection from how fruit and, and vegetables age that are helping all along the supply chain, helping you know providers, distributors, and retailers, and ultimately consumers to, to waste less produce. As we conclude, I want to ask both Kelly and Dale a question about hurdles. What are the biggest hurdles to achieving the UN Sustainable Development Goal 12.3 of reducing food waste at retail and consumer levels by 50% and reducing food loss across supply chains? And Kelly, would you like to start on that one? Yeah, you know, Dale, you you mentioned a lot of really great technologies that are in, in development or exist currently that can help consumers and, you know, at the retail level find food that is near expiration but still edible they can buy it at a you know lower cost and also helps mitigate waste unfortunately i think it makes me think of one of the hurdles that exist is surrounds regulations and even in our country yeah. the united states those regulations haven't kept up with i guess the times if you will and and the need to mitigate food loss and waste is often barred by regulatory so Thankfully, there are some countries that are making great headway in terms of regulations. France, for example, has a regulation that they just implemented a few years ago, I believe, that grocers can't discard food that is considered still edible. So they actually have to find a way to get it to the people who need it. But that's unfortunately the exception. Uh, So there's definitely some, some work that needs to happen on the regulatory side to make things easier and more streamlined so that we can start really implementing technologies and um, ideas at a larger scale. Yeah, I think also, I mean, you mentioned regulation and and in this country, I mean, you're right, it is a huge hurdle because it it seems that the U.S. on the national level is behind other countries when it comes to kind of reckoning specifically with best buy, sell by expiration dates. Nobody knows what the heck any of those mean. They're Mm -hmm. on products, manufacturers, don't have any incentive to do anything, but just kind of slap them on anywhere 
that they'll fit. And as a result, consumers are really frustrated. I think there's a lot of potential. You know, if it's not outright regulation, maybe it's uh, you know, there's a company uh, like Hellman's, a Unilever brand, is kind of leading the way in trying to get legislation in the U.S. that would address this. That could go a long, long way to literally cutting food waste significantly because so much is wasted at the consumer level. And a lot of it's by people are like, I don't know what this date means, but I'm not going to take a chance. So I'm going to throw it out. And I think the other, you know, maybe hurdle here that also is an opportunity for potential progress is human nature, right? So our nature has been to just kind of ignore food waste. Food has been cheap, not as cheap as it used to be for one thing. And two, consumers, especially younger ones are saying, you know, we, we know we've got impact on brands and industry and the economy through what we think and believe, you know, whether it's purpose-driven kind of motivation or whatever, or it's a sustainability and climate concern. And those kinds of things are going to come increasingly to bear and businesses are paying attention to that. And I don't think it's going to be any different with food waste in that regard. Well, Kelly and Dale, thank you both very much. Lots of great insights there. Kelly Hensel is Food Technology Magazine's Deputy Managing Editor for Print and Digital. Dale Buss is a veteran business journalist and food technology contributing editor. The fourth and final article in the Food Waste series, which includes links to the previous three, appears in the December-January issue. Last September, the Biden administration hosted a one-day White House conference on hunger, nutrition, and health, the first such gathering since 1969. The invitation-only event assembled experts in nutrition, food security, and healthcare in support of a coordinated national policy to fight hunger, obesity, and other challenges. IFT's Senior Director of Government Affairs and Nutrition, Anna Rosales, was at the conference and wrote in a recent essay that while the event itself was significant, it also exposed the need for better science-based collaboration across the food system. Anna and I recently spoke to recap her observations and talk about what comes next. So Anna, thanks for coming on the podcast today. Thank you for having me. 50 years is a long time. There was a lot of anticipation built up over this White House conference. Talk a little bit about what the expectations were going in and what's your sense of whether the event lived up to them? Oh, that's a big question because... I think the expectation was that it was just the start, that the conference was just an event. It wasn't the whole thing. Um, most of the work from the first White House conference, it came after the actual conference. And I'd expect the same thing here. So we're yet to see if it will live up to expectations, but I would say the opportunity is there. The um, The pillars from the White House conference, those are the same pillars, strategy on hunger, nutrition, and health. And it set the framework. So it gave us kind of this way to operate and set some goals. And it's up to everyone else to collaborate and make it happen. And by everyone, I, I literally mean everyone. Like there's a strong push for a whole of government, whole of society approach, working across government agencies, working across public, private, citizens, everyone. <laughs> Food's become so politicized in recent years. Was there any sense being there that, I mean, were there any winners and losers in this discussion that that emerged from the discussion? I don't think so at this point, to be honest with you. It was really intended to be bipartisan in nature and bringing it together. I mean, food should not be a partisan issue. Hunger, nutrition, security should not be a partisan issue. And that was really kind of the conversation that I was hearing when I was there. I mean, this will show up in different ways in the years to come. Next year is a farm bill year. We'll have different legislation and, and bills that will go through. And of course, those will have political aspects to them. But I didn't get the sense that anybody won or lost. Since the conference at the end of September, you've been um, either hosting or participating in a number of post-conference listening sessions, other discussions within the community. Uh, what's your What's your big takeaway so far from those conversations? One is that there are a lot of groups and individuals doing some really fabulous work, but I would say that more often than not, that's happening in silos. They're researching, the piloting, the work, it's 
one segment of the food system or in one segment of an intervention. And that information isn't being shared. Those best practices aren't being amplified and they're not having that opportunity to really come to scale. So I would say that we need to work across the food system to bring forward the sustainable, scalable change. And from my perspective, I believe that there is a wonderful opportunity for IFT, the Institute of Food Technologists, and our members to be a part of this solution. As I like to say that food brings people together, but food science brings together the food system. And our members, being those science of food professionals, really have that opportunity to connect upstream and downstream and bring impact to scale. One of the pillars in the White House plan is around this concept of food as medicine. And I've read a lot of competing interpretations about that term. Uh, what, what does it mean in this context and, and, and what opportunities does it present? Yeah, I think everyone has a little bit of a different definition of what is food as medicine. But what I heard at the conference and in the national strategy were three kind of examples of what is meant in this context of using the term food as medicine. One is physician training and nutrition. So integrating nutrition coursework into medical training. The other was produce prescriptions, having healthcare professionals prescribing produce to improve a patient's diets which has a really big impact for consumers and patients because the healthcare professional, the physician is one of the most trusted individuals in a person's life. And then the third was insurance covered medical foods. So having insurance covers um, gluten-free foods or things for or medical food nature. So those were the three big ones with food as medicine that I was hearing. So you mentioned earlier that the conference, I mean, it's it's just an event, right? It's the beginning of a very long process. What's next? What's the timeline that you anticipate for some of these ideas to begin to take root? I would say they're already starting to take root, but next year we got a big year in terms of, of policy happening. It's 2023 as a farm bill year, and that is one of our biggest pieces of legislation to go through. It it determines SNAP benefits, it determines research funding, like that'll be a big year to see how does the national strategy on hunger, nutrition and health show up in the 2023 farm bill. We'll also have a dietary guidelines process that's underway. The The call for nominations was this year, but the I received an email saying that they will announce the committee, the scientific committee in early 2023. And usually shortly after that, there's the open call for the evidence library and the process kind of gets rolling. So there's a lot of different things happening and it will be really fascinating to see how will the national strategy kind of take hold in those different pieces over the next year to help get us to that 2030 goal. You'd mentioned before about the the role that the that the food science community can play in all of this. What are the untapped opportunities that we should be exploring? I think the food science community needs to get in engaged with these processes. I really think that those are the untapped opportunities. Uh, whenever we're not engaged, we're not thought about, food scientists can take those recommendations and put them into products and have it show up in the marketplace and really change what's available to consumers and change how Americans are eating. So that's really where we have to work together to help bring change to the products that are available um, and to help impact consumers at scale along with massive amounts of education on the consumer level. Because on the one side, food scientists can change and create anything. The world's the limit. On the other side, a consumer has to want it and to understand the benefit of it. And that is a massive education piece that is even beyond the food scientist and will take a both government and non-governmental approach to bring forward. Anna Rosales is Senior Director of Government Affairs and Nutrition for IFT. You can read her full essay in the December-January issue of Food Technology. Thank you to this episode's sponsor, IFT's 2022 Compensation and Career Path Report. Get the latest information to help you negotiate your next raise or retain your most talented employees. Download a copy at ift.org slash salary survey. And that wraps up this episode of Omnivore. Thanks again to all of our guests and my colleagues at Food Technology. Omnivore is produced and distributed by the Institute of Food Technologists. If you enjoyed today's show and want to learn more about Food Technology Magazine or how to join the conversation by becoming an IFT member, visit ift.org membership. For more in-depth discussions about innovation in the science of food, 
Check out IFT's other podcast, SciDish, on the news and publications page of IFT.org. If you have comments or suggestions for future shows, just send us an email. The address is editors at IFT.org. For the entire team at Food Technology and IFT, I'm Bill McDowell. Thanks for listening and join us again for our next episode. This is Omnivore.